you're wondering if this is the church where we have it all together, the answer is no. <laughs> we, we, you missed four words. You missed four words. Okay. That's all right. Hey, if you're a guest this morning, welcome to Twickenham, where I hope it's immediately obvious that we don't take ourselves too seriously and that we like to give each other a hard time, but we do it out of love. So glad you're here. If you're a guest, we are glad you came. There's a card on the back of the seat in front of you. And you can fill that out and indicate any prayer requests you have. We will be praying over those first thing tomorrow morning. And if you're looking for a church home, we are always looking for new family members. And I'll tell you, we, we really don't have all the, we, we laugh about it, but we really don't have all the answers and we make a lot of mistakes, but we're trying to follow Jesus. And the good news is when we don't do it, in per, we don't do it when we don't do that perfectly, he understands and sends us his grace and his spirit to, his grace to, to forgive and his spirit to enable. And uh, we're just trying to make, make it together. So we'd invite you to come and join us on that journey. It's a good group of folks here. And uh, if you're a guest, you look around, you think, man, these people must have it all together. We don't. Uh, we are trying to be good, but a lot of times we're messy. So we're just glad you're here. Thanks for coming. Let's do this. Why don't we stand? Let's uh, give somebody nearby a hug and a handshake, and then we'll get on with the time of praise in just a minute. So glad you're here. Thanks for coming.
Therefore, I urge you, brothers and sisters, in view of God's mercy, to offer your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and pleasing to God. This is your true and proper worship. Do not conform to the pattern of this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. Then you will be able to test and approve what God's will is, his good, pleasing and perfect will. But be transformed. I will never be the same again. I can never return. I've closed the door. I will walk the path. I'll run the race. And I will never be the same again. I will never be the same. Yeah. 
selflessness, about giving ourselves up, being transformed and changed. This morning as we take our offering just now, I hope you'll consider the words of this song. As we give of our things, we're also offering of ourselves and of our heart. Let's take our offering. Here's my heart, Lord. Here's my Yeah. 
Over a week ago, two good Samaritans were murdered in Portland, Oregon on a train when they attempted to intervene on behalf of two young women who were being verbally assaulted by a white supremacist. The attacker drew a knife and stabbed both men to death. A couple of weeks ago, 23 people were killed in Manchester, England, when a Muslim terrorist set off a suicide bomb after an Ariana Grande concert. And then just yesterday, seven people in London were killed in three separate terrorist attacks. The world we live in is violent and it is dangerous. It always has been. And that makes this moment in our worship every Sunday crucially important. This is when we remember that Jesus took up a cross, not a sword, that he was willing to die, not kill, to make things right, and that his way is the way of the cross, not a crown, a way of sacrifice, not success, a way of love, not of hate. Now, Portland's a long way from here. It's on the other corner of the United States. And England, Manchester, and London are longer still. So it's sort of hard to imagine what you and I can do about violence in Portland or violence in Britain. So let's think closer to home. As you take communion this morning, as you share in this bread and in this cup, Reflect on your relationships. Are there any that need attention? Do do you need to forgive someone? Do you need to seek somebody's forgiveness? And after you think about those relationships and their needs in the context of this communion, as we share this bread and this wine, this these symbols that remind us of someone who is willing to give up everything to make a relationship right, then resolve this week to lean into those relationships with healing because Jesus Christ leaned in for us. Let's pray. Father, we receive this bread as a manifestation of your grace toward us, a symbol of your sacrifice, a reminder of what you were willing to give in order to regain and keep a relationship with us. We are not worthy to receive it, but we are grateful that you have made us worthy through Jesus to sit at your table, to enjoy your company. Help us learn through this reminder to enjoy one another to forgive and be forgiven, to make peace where there has been none, to show love where there has been only hate, to forgive even when the sin has been great. That is what you did for us as we receive this bread. Help us to remember that and then to pass that peace to others. In Jesus' name we pray, amen.
Let's pray again. Father, only you could bring beauty out of something as ugly as a cross. Only you could bring life out of death, peace out of bloodshed, and love out of hate. You did it then, and you did it for us. And as we share this cup, we remember that, and we're grateful. And we would pray that you would do it again. Do it again. In Jesus' name, amen. When my love for man grows deep, when for stronger faith I see, hill Calvary I go to thy seas of fear and woe.
There's a, a book that was written uh, quite a few years ago called Soul Tsunami by a guy named Leonard Sweet, and he tells a story, it's a true story, of two young men in a town in Brazil who were looking to make a quick buck, and so they broke into this shut-down radiation clinic, and they removed, stole a derelict cancer therapy machine. The device contained a stainless steel cylinder about the size of a gallon paint can, and they sold it to a junk dealer for $25. Inside the can was a, a cake of crumbly powder that produced a luminous blue light, and the junk dealer was really intrigued by it, so he took it home, and he broke open the canister, and he gave some of that uh, blue powder to friends and family. His six-year-old niece actually sprinkled it on her arms and her legs and her face, and she danced around in the tropical night glowing, and it uh, made their street look like a carnival. The dust was actually a material called cesium-137. It's a highly radioactive substance used in some medical and industrial devices. The little girl was sick by morning and then three weeks later, she passed away. Three others died as well. 200 people were hospitalized. Two houses were demolished. Uh, and then the topsoil on which they sat was scraped up and trucked off to a hazardous waste site. It's a dismal story. It's a horrible story. But it stayed with me ever since I read Mr. Sweet's book 15 years ago. And I hope that story stays with you because it's a cautionary tale for you and for me and for our families. See, everybody knows that children are to be protected, that, that protecting children is the primary job of a family. It's one of our primary jobs, even in messy families. If you ask the question, should the children be protected? The, the answer is going to be a resounding yes. The, the more important question, and the one that we're going to wrestle with this morning, the one that's going to confront us, is what, what do we need to protect our children from? What is it that we need to be protected from? Now, if we went around the room and we just kind of gave everybody a chance to raise your hand and shout it out, we'd probably get a variety of answers to that question. There would be the usual concerns. Alcohol, tobacco, and firearms would come up right? Drugs, pornography, violence on television, predators, those are certainly real issues, real threats, real dangers, present dangers. But there's another answer that is both more fundamental and more comprehensive to what we need to protect our families from if we're going to move away from the messy and move toward the good. And I guess I should have mentioned this earlier, if you're a guest this morning, we're in, a, we're in a series called Good and Messy. It's about our families. And we've been talking about the fact that good families are not perfect and messy families are not necessarily failures. We want to move away from messy toward the good, but, but all of us have got a little bit of some junk in there, right? So that's, that's where all this is coming from. How do we how do we protect ourselves, and, 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 and more importantly, what, what is the real danger, the real threat? So this morning, here's the, one I, the thing I want us to think about. If, if we're going to move toward the good and away from the messy, we need to protect ourselves, our families, our children from culture. Now, the, the problem that we're immediately confronted with is figuring out what the word culture means. Because when you're in it and surrounded by it and permeated with it, it's, it's difficult to define. It's even difficult to see culture. This week, somebody told me a story about this old fish that swims by 
two little fish, two young fish. And as he passed by, the old fish says, water's fine today, isn't it, boys? And when the old fish was gone, one young fish turned to the other and said, what the heck is water? We, we, we can ask the same thing about culture. What, what, what do you mean by that? Well, you, let me see if this makes it at least less muddled. By culture, I mean what seems natural and what seems normal in our society. The unquestioned assumptions about how things are, the invisible web of beliefs that stretch out and across and around and through our society. Tim Keller, uh, many of you have read some, uh, uh, several, probably uh, two or three books by Tim Keller. One of, them, one of his uh, very accessible books is called The Reason for God. There's some, that's some great writing. He wrote, uh, there's another book he wrote that most of you probably haven't read because the title is Preaching. And if you think listening to it is boring, you should try reading about preaching. It's really bad. But in his book, Preaching, Tim Keller calls culture, these hidden beliefs, these, he calls them narratives. They're the stories by which we live. And, and, and he uses words like hidden and invisible. And that's where we connect with the story that I, the dismal story that I started with. It's what those folks in Brazil could not see that posed the greatest danger. They could see the the stainless steel container, and they could see the blue luminescent globe, but they couldn't see the cesium atoms combining with moisture in the air, breaking down and releasing radiation. It's what you can't see that often poses the greatest threat, the greatest danger to you, your children, to your family. So this morning, I want to focus just on one of those virtually hidden, invisible cultural narratives, one of those stories that represents a danger not just to your children but to parents and grandparents, to every family or individual in this room. In fact, I think this one that, I'm, that we're going to talk about may contribute the most to what makes us messy. But here's a key point we need to emphasize up front. We are not talking about protecting ourselves or our children from people. We're not talking about uh, a battle against flesh and blood. One of the strategic, strategic mistakes I think conservative Christians made, and we did this decades ago in the so-called, I don't even like the term, culture wars, is, is that we forgot that people are not our enemy. Now I think the other side is making that mistake, and they didn't learn from us. But what, what, what we've got to remember is that every person alive is made in the image and likeness of God. We, we started in Genesis chapters 1 and 2 at the beginning of this series, and we keep going back there because every human being is precious and valued and important and eternal. We are not at odds with people. We are at odds with a belief, a system of belief, not with a group of people. Paul put it this way, 2 Corinthians chapter 10, verses 3 through 5. For though we live in the world, we do not wage war as the world does. The weapons we fight with are not the weapons of the world. On the contrary, they, the weapons we fight with, have divine power to demolish strongholds. We demolish arguments, not people. And every pretension that sets itself up against the knowledge of God. And we take captive, not people, but thoughts to make them obedient to Christ. In Acts chapter 2, uh, toward the end of it, it says that the church enjoyed the favor of all the people uh, when it first got started. I think we would, we would enjoy it again, at least more of it, if we embraced Paul's approach. People are not the enemy. So, and I, I want to be really clear about that because anytime we start talking about culture, it's so easy to start naming people or groups of people that are the enemy, and they're not. It's the ideas that we want to defend against. Second thing I, I want to acknowledge before we get into the one narrative and culture that really messes us up, I think we need to celebrate that there are some very positive things going on in our culture. And for example... A recent LA Times article noted that one of the perks 
that Silicon Valley companies are providing their employees is paid time off to spend in volunteer work. Uh, Air, Airbnb offers employees four paid hours a month to be involved in local service projects. Uh, Dropbox, a lot of you use Dropbox. We use Dropbox around the office all the time to send big files back and forth. Gives employees 32 paid hours a year to volunteer at, at the nonprofit of their choosing. And then the company regularly hosts company-sponsored events where employees serve meals uh, and, and, and to local charities. In other words, in order to keep and attract the best talent, these, these tech companies are incentivizing employees by giving them the opportunity to do what we do at church for free. Come work for our company where you can use your gifts and talents to serve others. I call that a kingdom win. That's a good thing going on in our culture. Research from the Brookings Institute est estimates that by 2005, 75% of the workforce will be millennials, people born between 1982 and 2003. Brookings says that when that happens, when, when, they, when they become the dominant cohort in the workforce, that their values, the things the millennials value, will become more ascendant, and those values include, and, and I quote, corporate social responsibility, higher worth placed on experiences than on material things, and community building. That sounds like a kingdom win to me, a kingdom of Christ win. Now, I, I bet a lot of you have had sensitivity training in your workplace, training designed to help you avoid expressions and behaviors that could be construed as racist or sexist. You know, racism is probably, if, if it's not number one, it's, it's in the top two of cultural sins right now. Justice, equality, love, are, are th those, those things are just, th that's the, the ultimate in anything less than that. Are, are, they're not just tolerated, those virtues are actually promoted at every level. And that sounds an awful like an awful lot like something Paul said in Ephesians chapter 4. Do not let any unwholesome talk come out of your mouths, but only what is helpful for building others up according to their needs, that it may benefit those who listen. That people are concerned about how their words affect others sounds like a kingdom win to me. It is simply not accurate to say that in every aspect our culture is going to Gehenna in a handbasket. There are some extremely godly narratives playing out in our culture, and when we see them, we need to immediately celebrate those. That's the, in my mind, that's the kingdom of God breaking into the kingdom of the world. And, 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 a lot of, and when we see those, we need to connect those narratives back to God because a lot of people are doing some really godly things, and they have no idea that what they are doing was God's idea to begin with. So it's a neat way to draw all that back together. So I wanted to get those two things out there before we talked about the, the thing that is really a threat to us and our families in this culture, because in, in right now it sounds like this is a commercial for the awesomeness that is our culture. But for all the good, there are some equally destructive narratives, and the most dominant is what Robert Bella called expressive individualism in his book, Habits of the Heart. Tim Keller calls it the sovereign self, and in their very fine book, Good Faith, which is a, a book you really should read, Good Faith, by David Kinnaman and Gabe Lyons, they call it the morality of self-fulfillment. Whatever you call it, here's how that narrative goes. And it's, I'm telling you, this is, in, in my mind, this is the, the most dangerous thing confronting you, your family, your children. Here's how it goes. To find yourself, look within yourself. All you need is inside you. To be fulfilled in life, pursue the things you most desire. You are free to live any way you choose as long as nobody gets hurt. And to be truly yourself, you must discover your deepest desires 
and then fulfill them. What I just gave you is a summary of Pinterest or Facebook or any other social media. It used to be that individual rights and desires were limited by certain boundaries, family, faith, tradition, institutions. I had to take into account that how I lived had an impact on other people, and there were certain boundaries that were set up that limited. I I had desires, I had rights, I had dreams as as an individual, but all those had to be sublimated to all these boundaries. Back then, the heroic life was the one that sacrificed self for the good of others. My dad's a, a great example of this. Dad came from a family of southern gospel singers. They used to appear on local radio stations around North Alabama singing southern gospel. When he was in the army, he hooked up with three other guys, all of them from Alabama, uh, and all of them loved southern gospel, and and they actually kind of made a splash in that genre. And they talked of taking their group on the professional circuit once their enlistment ended. And then they got married and started having babies. And since they couldn't support their families on aspiring Southern gospel singer incomes, they all went to work. Devon down in Bruton opened up uh, an Atasco hardware store. and The other guys went to work for different places. Dad took a job working for Lockheed Aircraft Corporation. Personal desires, aspirations, even dreams were submitted to the needs of others, to the needs of family. None of those guys, including my dad, were perfect men. But the water they swam in, the culture they were surrounded by, pushed them in the direction of duty and of self-sacrifice. The water we swim in today flows in a different direction. It pushes us in the direction not of duty, but of desire. Not of self-sacrifice, but of self-assertion. The interests of the individual outweigh the interests of the family, the faith, the company, the church, the community, the country, everything. The heroic life today is the one that looks within to find its deepest desires and then asserts those desires in spite of what the family needs, in spite of even what God says. If this is what will make me happy and fulfilled, then no one and nothing should stand in my way. If I am not happy and fulfilled in my marriage, it's not just okay for me to leave and start over. It is the right thing for me to do for me. Now, you know, I got to tell you, a lot of that sounds pretty compelling. Don't, Don't let anybody tell you it can't be done. Find your dream and pursue it. Don't dream your life, live your dreams. That's Oprah. The biggest adventure you can take is to live the life of your dreams. Look within to find your deepest desires. Give your life to fulfill them, and they will give you a lifetime. It makes the self-assertive life sound like a Disney movie or like the luminescent blue powder those folks in Brazil found. Zach Eswine wrote a book called The Imperfect Pastor. That's another book you would find enormously boring. But for preachers, it's pretty good. He warns about self-assertive desire. He says, make no mistake, desire is a firework. Handled wisely, it fills the night sky with light, color, beauty, and delight. Handle desire poorly, and you can burn your neighborhood down. James, brother of Jesus, said something about desire too. He said, what causes fights and quarrels among you? Don't they come from your desires that battle within you? You desire to have, you don't have, so you kill. You covet, but you you cannot get what you want, and so you quarrel and fight. You do not have because you do not ask God, and when you do ask, you do not receive because you ask with wrong motives that you may spend what you get on your pleasures. 
So how do we protect ourselves? How do we protect our families? How do we protect our children from this cultural narrative of me first, of self-expression, of the autonomous self? Well, first, just being aware that it exists, that it exists, helps us defend against it. Music, movies, TV, video games, apps, commercials, every other kind of media is constantly reinforcing this idea that self-fulfillment is the highest good. I'm not going to tell you to go all Amish and get rid of all media, but we should engage it critically. What messages are we being fed? What values are being pumped into our homes and into our, into our heads? When you see even a print ad, it, what, is that, what is that appealing to? Is it all about me and, and my needs and fulfilling me? When you, when you watch a movie or a television program or you see a commercial, if you don't skip those like most of us do these days, just pay attention to what, what they're trying to tell you. Just be aware. Second, we need to be telling and retelling the gospel narrative, the Jesus narrative to ourselves and to our children. The dominant cultural story calls us to sacrifice everything for our own dreams. The gospel story is about one who sacrificed himself for others. Our culture tells us that to be fulfilled in life, we, we've got to pursue the things we most desire. Jesus said that seeking first his kingdom and his righteousness was the way to be truly fulfilled. Culture tells us that the highest goal in life is pleasure. Scripture tells us that the highest goal in life is giving glory to God. That's why we, we read that passage from Romans earlier. Do not be conformed to this world. Be transformed by the renewing of your minds. And we're, we're so forgetful of that. And we're so easily distracted. We, we always have been. It's not new. Which is why, from the very beginning, God reminded his people to remember. Deuteronomy chapter 6, listen to what he said. Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. Love the Lord with your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind, and all your strength. These commandments that I give you today are to be on your hearts. Impress them on your children. Talk about them when you sit at home, when you walk along the road, when you lie down, and when you get up. That's from Deuteronomy 6, 4 through 7. Verse 12 says... Be careful that you do not forget the Lord. Tell and retell and tell again the gospel narrative, the Jesus story. Third, take advantage of the resources that can equip you to live an, a life that is not conformed to the culture, a life that's different. This morning, uh, our children's ministry is, is kicking off the summer children's program. Before you leave today, if you haven't done it already, you need to go by the gym downstairs and just take a look at it. I, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to go in there this week and just sit down in one of those beach chairs and turn on the sound effects, and I'm going to pretend I'm at the beach because that's what it looks like. That's what it feels like in there. It is an awesome set for our summer program for our children. Go by and look at it. Your kids need to be a part of that. Your children need to be a part of that every Sunday morning. They need to be here in a Sunday school class, and you need to be in a journey group at 9 o'clock. That, that's there for you and for your children. They're getting alternative stories all week long through every conceivable media medium. You need to be sure they're here on Sunday mornings to get the Jesus story. In, in a few weeks... Caleb and Ashley Gendron, our, our new youth, youth ministers, will join us. Your students need to be a part of that teen ministry, and you need to be a part of it as well. You need to be involved in that as well. The uh, thing I really want to emphasize here, though, is that while you absolutely must take advantage of that resource, that resource can't be the only thing you do for your children, for your students, or for yourselves, for that matter. You, you and I are the primary responsibility holders for raising up children who are nurtured in the admonition of the Lord. We are the primary ones who are responsible for, for raising up our own children to be fully devoted followers of Jesus Christ. 
The children's ministry can't do that for you. The student ministry can't do that for you. And Steve, and as he leads us in our adult education program, our journey groups, Steve Krieger can't do that for you and me. We have to take responsibility for our children, for our students, and for ourselves. But if we're not even doing that, if we're not here on Sunday mornings, taking advantage of those opportunities, are we doing anything else? I'm getting in your grill a little bit here. Somebody asked me if I was going to preach a hellfire and brimstone sermon this morning. I don't know if this is hellfire and brimstone to you. Okay. There's things that you and I need to do to counter the messages we're receiving. And taking advantage of the resources that are available is one of them. Um, in August uh, 24 through 26, the Ethics and Religious Liberty Commission is going to host a conference on Christ centered parenting in a complex world, August 24th through 26th. You, uh, you can go online and, and look up erlc.com, see about that, and, or call our office, we'll give you information. I think a lot of us ought to go. I think we ought to, have, we ought to take a bunch of buses and go up there and hear this thing. Are you going to agree with everything you hear at, at the ERLC? Probably not. I'm not going to agree with everything I hear there, but that's okay. Hearing things that I don't agree with helps me grow. It helps me not be locked into the way I've always been. It makes me confront the things that I believe and ask questions of them. So you need to be a part of that. In his confessions, Augustine of Hippo, perhaps the most influential thinker of Christianity since Paul, looked back on his past and he recognized why, for a period of time, he had failed so miserably to follow Jesus. He said, my sin was this, that I looked for pleasure and beauty and truth, not in him, but in myself. And the search led me instead to pain, confusion, and error. It's crazy, the narrative of the sovereign self the narrative of the assertive self, the narrative of looking in yourself is not new at all. In fact, it's old. It's as old as the Garden of Eden. But it's still just as deadly as that blue, as that blue Brazilian powder. The culture tells you to find yourself. Jesus, and the last song we'll sing this morning, tells you to lose yourself. Because with Jesus, losing is finding. Dying to self is living, and giving him control means that you get a handle on life. And admitting that you're a mess is the first step toward getting good. Let's stand. Let's sing together. Still your mercy remains. And should I stumble again, still I'm caught in your grace, everlasting. Your light will shine when it all else fades, never ending. Your glory goes beyond all fame. You will above all else, my purpose remains, the art of Cries out.
Hey, Ann uh, Denham has come forward this morning, and she's got uh, some big decisions that she says she has to make, but those decisions are coming at a time when she is filled with a lot of anxiety and is struggling with depression. So can you imagine? If you've got big decisions, that can keep you up at night anyway. But when you're struggling with depression and you're feeling a lot of anxiety, how hard it must be just to confront the idea of having to make those decisions. So Anne has come forward and said, I just need you to pray for me because I, I just really need your help. So what a great example, uh, Anne, for coming to the church and letting us pray for you about this. Hey, if, you're, if you don't do church very much or if you're a guest here, this may seem a little weird that we work our stuff out in front of each other. It's weird. <laughs> it is weird. But it's better than not working your stuff out at all. And we're in this together. So we're going to pray for Anne. Let me ask you to stand and just sort of as a symbolic show. And if you want to come down and just put a hand on her and tell her you love her, you can do that while we pray. All right? Father, we are so grateful that we don't have to pretend we're not a mess, that you've given us this family of brothers and sisters uh, from all over the country and the world, different backgrounds. God, sometimes it feels like we're from different universes, and yet here we are in this family at Twickenham where it's okay not to be okay, where it's okay to be a mess. And Anne has just demonstrated that for us. And now she's surrounded by people who love her and who are praying for and supporting her. And we just want to ask you very specifically to give her a peace that passes understanding. She, she's done what you ask her to do. She's cast all her anxiety on you because you care. That's what, you're, that's what Paul told us. And now that she's done that, we're asking you to do your part and give her the peace that passes understanding that will guard her heart and mind in Christ Jesus. Take away her depression. Help her to feel calm and confident not in her own abilities or wisdom, but in you. And help her to know she's not alone, that she's cared for and loved by people who are just as messy and that we're all walking together to our Father who loves us. Bless Anne. In Jesus' name, amen. Turn my heart, O Lord, like rivers. church said. Amen. Amen. Hey, thanks for being here. Just a few things as we close and we'll be dismissed. One of the ways that you could really take Jody's lesson this morning and do something with it is a couple of areas that we really desperately need your help this summer that we have just not been able to fill. First of all, our children's summer camp for uh, those who are not as fortunate as most of us has already started this past week. They're in desperate need of volunteers to help support that program. There's a table set up downstairs in the lobby. Lori Beth White, who runs that program, will be down there. Uh, she needs people to help. We need you to help protect those kids. We continue to need volunteers for our children's ministry, both Sunday morning um, in worship and in class. Amy needs some of you to please sign up. You may have to miss class. Hey, that's okay. You're an adult. Um, she needs you to be there during worship. Hey, that's okay. It's good in here, but it can be good down there too. But they really, really need 
um, your support. Please sign up and help us with those two programs. Also, our children's ministry kickoff party is today. It starts as soon as we finish for all of our kids' nursery through the fifth grade. We've got lunch downstairs in the fellowship hall, and then is it raining? Good. I think we're outside after that because it's not raining. So that'd be great. Please stay and enjoy that time together. You also have a terrific Tuesday, Tuesday morning, 10 o'clock at Kids Space. Kid Space. So all of our kids will be there on Tuesday as well. Don't forget Dinner in a Devo, which starts this Wednesday. And also additional new elder recommendation forms have gone out in the lobbies this morning. Pick one up as we begin this process process of selecting some new elders in the next few weeks. Hey, thanks for being here. Have an outstanding day. We'll close in prayer. Father, it's been good to be here this morning. What a privilege we have to come together as a body of your people without fear of persecution. Well, thank you for the message that we've heard. Thank you for blessing Jody with talent and for his ability to open your word to us. We pray that we would take that with us out into the world this week, that uh, every day of our lives will be a service uh, and worship to you, Father. We're thankful for this body of your people at Twickenham. Bless our staff and elders as they lead us. Give them a special measure of wisdom and discretion as they make the decisions that uh, guide this church, Father. You've blessed us in too many ways to, uh, to recall, but uh, the greatest blessing of all, Father, is the gift of your Son and his sacrifice and the path that that gives us back to you. And it's in his name we pray. Amen.